Welcome to Change the World. My name is Guy Dauncey, and this is the show where I like to meet people and share them with you, people who are doing really inspiring, creative, good stuff in the world. It's all about solutions and vision and not just about moaning and groaning. My guest today is Jim Cooperman, who's author of the best-selling book, Everything Shoe Swap, which tells you where he's living. Jim moved to the Shoe Swap in 1969 as a Vietnam War resistor and a back-to-the-lander. And over the succeeding years, he has taught school, worked in construction and log building, operated a sawmill, and edited the BC Environmental Report. His environmental work alone led to the protection of over 25,000 hectares of new parks in the Shuswap. He lives with his wife, Kathy, in what he says is a log home. I say it's a glorious log palace that they built on 40 acres above Shuswap Lake, where they've raised their five children. And his website, if you want to explore more, is www.shuswappassion.ca. So first, Jim, where is the Shuswap and why do you love it so much? It's Shushwap's located between Kamloops and Revelstoke, and it's 1.55 million hectares, and it's just a glorious place. I love it for its diversity, the fact that we have a beautiful warm lake that you can swim in all summer long. It has fabulous culture, recreational opportunities, and one of the best things is there's uh, very few crowds and absolutely no traffic. Hmm. And uh, yeah, it's a great place to visit and a uh, great place to live here. And I'm Fantastic. sure glad I picked it 52 years ago. And I that was a lucky the move. same place all <laughs> that time. So I know from your work that you produced a video about the sure swap, and it's a, it's quite long. We're going to show the first three minutes of it. Just give you give our viewers on Vancouver Island and elsewhere on YouTube a sense of the landscape, the home where you come from. So let's do that now. Sure.
Well, that was amazing. Now I get a real sense of, of why you're there. Um, so you talk a lot in the book about bioregionalism. Your, your book, of Everything Should Swap, is immersed in this concept of bioregionalism. What is bioregionalism, Jim? It means fostering a sense of place. And really, uh, when you think about what your program is all about, changing the world, well, you have the best chance to make a difference in changing the world where you live, in your home place. It's true. We don't have much influence provincially, federally, even less uh, globally, but we all have uh, some ability to make a difference where we live. But that's not a thorough description of bioregionalism. There's more to it than that, I know. Well, for sure. Um, you know, uh, it was a really popular term back in the 70s about when it was first coined, but uh, you don't hear it very much uh, these days at all. But what you do hear are things like the 100 mile diet and shop locally. Both of those are very strong principles for bioregionalism. Yeah. Am I right that the bioregion is defined by its watershed boundaries? That's correct. First of all, and that's the first step, is understanding what your region is, where it is, and where the boundaries are. And that was my first step in, in writing the book. Before I could even begin writing the book, uh, we had to determine the boundaries. And, and there, it had never been mapped before the Shushwap watershed. Wow. And so that was my first project. And so I... Uh, and managed to get the help of actual governments, uh, both the provincial and federal government. And it was uh, uh, DFO, Department of uh, Fisheries and Oceans, that actually uh, provided the uh, layout work for, for the poster behind, right behind me. This is actually the Shushwap, and this is the poster we created. And I uh, raised over $5,000 to do the printing of it. And so we, we published 3,000 copies, and that was back in the year two, uh, 2010. So once we determine the actual boundaries, then it, we can go ahead and, and describe it in detail, every, all parts of it. So within the yeah. shoe swap, there's eight major river systems. And those rivers flow in every different direction, believe it or not. I mean, in, in uh, most uh, watersheds, uh, there's basically uh, rivers would flow either one or two directions, but here they, they flow uh, from the north, from the south, from the east, but they all end up right here in the South Thompson River, which uh, is at Chase. And the South Thompson flows into the Fraser, I think? That's right. The South right. Thompson joins with the North Thompson in Kamloops, uh, the meeting of the waters, Kumkloops is the Sequetmic name for it. Uh -huh. And from there it goes down and joins the Fraser River. So what are the major communities in the Shuswap watershed, just to give viewers a sense of identification? Well, there's only one really major community, and that's Salmon Arm. And that's pretty much in the center of the Shuswap. But then you have uh, smaller communities like Chase and Sorrento and Sycamus. And um, there's, there's a few communities that some people aren't really aware that they are in the Shushwap. Uh, Enderby is sort of half and half. People pretty much are aware. But the uh, other little two communities, Lumby and Cherryville, uh, folks there, many of them think that they live in the no North Okanagan. And the reason being is that when they determine the regional district boundaries, they went to folks in Enderby and said, well, do you want to be in the North Okanagan or do you want to be in the Shushwap Regional District? <laughs> and so they, they thought, well, we want to be connected to Kelowna because that's where we drive yeah. all this, or Vernon, which is really close. So they chose yeah. to be in the North Okanagan. But, and, your, uh, and, yeah. and, and your other community, the First Nation, I believe is Sequempenk? Sequempenk. Sequempenk. Yeah. And how many thousand years have they lived there? Over 10,000. For sure, wow. and uh, but it, you know probably the last three thousand they actually had their identity of a as a first nation. Before that, we really do not have much uh, of an idea of how how the all the first nations were structured. But it, what's incredible about British Columbia is 
there are 32 dialects in this one province. So yeah. that means there were 32 nations, each with a quite distinctive language that made those boundaries for those nations pretty much maintain themselves over thousands and thousands of years. You can't find an example of like of that in in uh, other parts of the world because well, that's got a, it's got one, to be the mountain in the in the prairies you've got the Cree and the Ojibwe chasing each other and conquering each other and the, we've got mountains here in BC it makes it slight, kind of harder yeah but uh, like the shoe shop's very close to the Okanagan and the Okanagan nation is right there and here's the shoe shop and they have different languages wow. and that boundary kept pretty much the same for the thousands of years so, so I'm yeah, so I, I'm, people yeah. often think that the First Nations were at war with each other all the time, but really they were at peace more than they were at war. Yeah, so I'm guessing that in your research for this book, you had many, many long conversations with First Nations elders and, and leaders. Uh, I wouldn't say that, actually. Uh, huh. uh, no, I think I, most of the research I did was you know using books and going to museums and going through archives. There were a few uh, First Nations people that I worked with uh, to in my uh, writing of the book, um, but primarily I, I wrote the chapter, the Sequetmic chapter, and then they reviewed it and made suggestions okay. and made changes based on that. Okay. So in fact, the entire book was well reviewed. It was peer reviewed. So that, that leads me to another thing I know about the book. You had phenomenal community involvement in producing the book and in financing it as well. I mean, exactly. you're saying that you printed 3,000 copies of that map. That's all over the place. But you've really got this book out into the community as well, haven't you? That's right. Um, the way I approached it was that um, rather than a, a typical situation where you, you look for a publisher to publish it, and you know how difficult that is, guys. I know. <laughs> since you're a writer, too. Um, I, I, I approached a couple of publishers uh, before, long before it was completed, and they weren't interested at all. Oh, too regional, they said. So the chances of that happening were <laughs> impossible. And so then I thought, well, you know what I should do? Um, because I wasn't interested in making money with the book. I, I, I retired and I, I don't need any extra income. I'm fortunate that way. So. Um, I came up with the idea that uh, I, I donate the proceeds to a charitable organization. And then the, the idea, I, I thought of one, and then that didn't turn out. And someone suggested, well, why don't you go to the school board? So I went to the, to the schools, uh, school district 83, and they were right into it. The school superintendent and I worked very closely. And... Um, so then I, I basically raised over $40,000 to publish the book. So that paid for, for the production of the book as well as the printing. So we printed, uh, in the first printing, we printed 2,800 copies. The 800 copies went to the people that, that uh, donated to the book. So everybody uh, received one copy for every $100 they donated. And some places donated the largest I think was two thousand dollars from just one business yeah. and I went to every local government so all the communities got on board the regional district I had amazing support That's and so fantastic. Uh, once the book was published then the uh the proceeds um we saved um uh, enough money to publish a second printing, and then the rest of the money went uh, to the schools to uh, for outdoor learning. So, so classes, gonna, classes uh, went on uh, trips. Well, I wanted to ask a question around the schools. If you think about your bioriginal vision, how would you like to change the way schooling and education is done so that young people grow up to appreciate and understand their bioregion? Well, good question. Uh, and, and that's one of the purposes of writing the book is that students who grow up here have a chance to learn about where they live and as a result gain more appreciation for where they live and will respect it more and maybe desire to eventually stay here and live here the rest of their lives. Yeah. So um, uh, I connected with some teachers at the school, uh, at the high school, and they were very keen about it. So. Uh, 
one thing that happened that made it even more possible was that they changed the curriculum in British Columbia, which gave more leeway to teachers to do more experimental curriculum um, design in their own classrooms. So now this, the, the book is actually being taught at grade nine, uh, uh, the sequentment chapter and the settlement chapter. And, um, and it's also being used in other grades. It's a resource book, even in the, in the elementary schools. And it's, it's basically snowballing. And, and to help make that happen, I, t I created a teacher's guide. Mm -hmm. And in the, one of the uh, basic uh, tenets of the teacher's guide is that hopefully the students will not see the book as the beginning, but uh, I'm sorry, not see the book as the end, but as the beginning. So yeah. that would inspire them to. It's an invitation. Them. Yeah. An invitation to get out there. Yeah. So one of the one of the best ways that people come to love that bioregion is through hiking and exploring. And I know through you, can you tell us about the Shuswap Trail Alliance and what they've been able to achieve? Yeah, in, in uh, around 2006 or seven, um, a fellow by the name of Phil McIntyre Paul um, began an effort to uh, start an organization that would promote trails and promote uh, building new trails. And that group has just grown and grown and grown and they have a very large budget. Uh, they're very successful at getting grants and so on. And they've probably doubled or tripled even the, the number of trails and the number of kilometers uh, in, in our region. And um, their current project is working on the new rail trail. And that would go from Sycamuse and all the way down to Armstrong. And then one day it, they'll maybe make a connection to the Southern Trail, which is in, in existence already that goes from uh, below Vernon all the way down to the border. So, so part of that is happening. In, in, in the mountains and the forest, they're literally out there with their pickaxes and their shovels making these trails oh, themselves. Yeah. yeah, they have crews and they employ young people in the summer and it's and just do they, do they get permission to work with the forest companies that own the forest? <laughs> well, um, technically, the forest companies don't actually own the forest. They have a, no, they have a license. So I'm from Vancouver. I'm from Vancouver. Well, for the way the rules are written, because uh, the public and even a district manager can't change anything when it comes to uh, logging out there. It's all up to the companies for what they want to do because of what the BC Liberals did back in the early 2000s. But, uh, oh, for sure, they work with the forest companies and they work with uh, BC timber sales. And um, uh, But primarily they work with uh, BC rec sites and trails because they're the ones that are responsible for uh, uh, approving new trails and so on. Yeah, so here on Vancouver Island, when on the East Coast, all of our land is owned by private forest companies because of the ENN land grant treaty. And so yeah, we're really, yeah. we're really short. I'm envious of all that trail system you've got there, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's growing uh, leaps so, and bounds. Yeah, yeah, I took you up to the Lee Creek Bluffs when you, you were did. It was a great climb. And, and uh, so, I'm, I've been working on getting a, an official trail there for since about 2008. And we're getting progress made they've got the design laid out and it yeah. would actually be bikeable so it'd be two loops cool. and uh it would be one of the best things ever for the north shoe shop that's where i live so how can better bioregional understanding and governance affect the same famous sockeye salmon run the adams run that you've got coming through your lands well i wish it could <laughs> well, let's imagine <laughs> that you're, uh, if you're, if you're everything we can to make uh, uh, their home place, uh, uh, their habitat in the interior when they come up the rivers to be as healthy as possible. And the, in the Adams, it is because it's a provincial park. Uh, however, uh, we have no control over what happens in the ocean. And, and as many of your listener viewers uh, know, um, we've got fish farms out there. I know they've removed some, but that's a big problem. Uh, and of course, the largest problem is overfishing, and and the, the uh, it's basically managed by the fishing companies. You know, we think, oh, the, it's up to the government as to what the quota is, but yeah. uh, there's a panel that makes the decisions, and the fishing companies have quite a large voice in the fishing unions on that panel, 
And typically they, they always uh, go kind of, oh, whoops, we had it all figured out that there'd be mm. this many fish. So we caught uh, this many. And as it turns out, oh, we weren't quite accurate for our estimate. Yeah, yeah. And that's so, typical. So of course, the other big problem with salmon is uh, a climate change and a warming ocean and... Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so sh shifting topic. You and you and Kathy have been growing, preserving, and storing your own food on your land for more than fifty years. How has it been for you, and how have you managed to keep your soil fertile when you take so much out of it in food each year? Well, those are good questions. Um, I'm always learning, and uh, every year I sort of uh, chalk up a little uh, something new. Um, Last year I was discovering a new vegetable, fennel. Fennel is an awesome vegetable because it, 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 the bugs don't bother it, you know, and we often have problems with garden pests and that's one of the challenges it takes. So, but uh, of course we add, add the manure and um, I've done green manuring before, you know, where you grow a cover crop. I don't do that very often. Um, I make compost a huge amount of compost every year and uh, I, I apply the compost directly to the plant so uh, for example for your brachias uh, um, once they get a certain size then I I do side dressing and that's giving the nutrients right to the plant rather than spreading it all over the garden well I, I, I saw a photograph on your blog of a wheelbarrow full of leeks and they're like they're the size of a wrist almost the old leeks right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we, we just the other day made the potato leek uh, soup, uh, the vichy swad. Oh, delicious. <laughs> and that's, you know, it's not just growing it, it's figuring out how to, how to make it last through the winter. And so um, we have different techniques depending on what we're harvesting. So we do a lot of drying and uh, we, we uh, only can those types of vegetables that really work well, like mostly the tomatoes. And uh, we, uh, we, when we dry food, we freeze it as well. Um, we, some foods we don't bother freezing because it loses so much nutrition. So we make soups and freeze the soups. So I gather you've also built yourselves a root cellar. You bet. Built a root cellar back in around 1972, but that only lasted about 40, 45 years. It was built out of logs. And you know, when you put dirt against logs, they don't last all that long in the ground. But it was amazing it lasted that long. So when, when we tore it down, we built a new one. Uh, I had to hire a contractor for the concrete work. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's uh, basically eight by 10 and, and it stores the apples and the root crops and we've got the leeks in there. And uh, yeah, it's, it does a great yeah. job. So, we're coming to the end of our time here, but the pandemic has changed so many things. And as we recover, how would you like things to be done differently in the true swap so that it can build back better, as Joe Biden likes to say? Well, that's interesting you pointed that out because um, our organization, I'm the president of the Shoe Environmental Action Society. We've been around since 1989. And we teamed up with two other organizations in the community, the Family Resource Center, and um, the uh, Shishwap Food Action Co-op. And uh, we um, obtained a small grant from Community Futures to hire uh, a PhD person who's very knowledgeable, young person. And she's doing a literature review of all the possible uh, ways to uh, achieve greater reliance in a community. Mm. And she's getting close to completing that. And I think it's not only going to be valuable for us here in the shoe shop, but I think it's going to be valuable for uh, the whole province and maybe even farther when, if we can get the, uh, get the story out there. So you're but talking about... What's that? Certainly, self reliance and and self you know resilience coming out of self reliance, right? Yes, exactly. Um, I ultimately, the more uh, we can look after our own needs, the more uh, re, re, we will approach reliance, self reliance here in the shoe shop. And um, of course, like in most parts of the world, you go into a store, and most of the food's coming from somewhere else. 
And we saw early in the pandemic when there were bare shells, uh, it really got everybody thinking, oh goodness, um, <laughs> this might be a harbinger of what could we could see in the future. So uh, uh, I would say much of what she's gonna write has to do with food and how we can uh, achieve uh, more self-reliance and, and, uh, and achieve um, uh, a situation where we're growing more of our own food here in the shoe shop. And, and do you have partnerships in the shoe swap that can sort of put her recommendations into action and make, change the policies and change the incentives and help people run successful businesses growing more food? Well, um, there's already been some effort in that in that way, and the uh, our regional district has uh, um, has uh, farming as part of its mandate now, and it, I think it even has a staff member uh, there to assist to improve. Um, uh, farming in the community so that's, that's good yeah. um, so basically uh, when you're talking about bioregionalism that's one of the reasons why it's important to concentrate your efforts in your local area because that's where it can have the most impact so i would i would think that this book you've produced along with the three thousand copies of the map they're going to make a lasting impact that's going to be you know be there for a hundred years and hopefully it's going to be one of your many legacies right <laughs> well, I hope so. Um, uh, you know, it's just this is volume one. So I'm working on volume two. And uh, volume one uh, basically is is an overview. And it, it, it gives you uh, a tour of the watershed. It talks about the geology, the ecology, equipment history, and the settlement history. But volume two goes into um, describing all the different communities as well as arts and culture, sports and recreation, and the economy. Cool. But I've been hampered because we're in the pandemic, and many of the yeah. things I want to write about aren't happening right so, now. So here's, here's my closing hope, that when the pandemic's over and we're free to tour and explore our beautiful province again, people will come to the Shoswap. They'll go to your website, shoswappassion.ca. They'll buy your book and use it as a guide to explore your lovely area. So, Jim, this has been fantastic. Thank you for all the work and love you put into all this. And um, my name's Guy Dawnsey. This has been Change the World. And look forward to another scintillating, exciting guest next week. Thanks for watching. Great. Thank you.